you've never gotten this quiet for me in times past. I'm, I gotta find out what the secret is. Maybe we should invite Pete here more often and you, know, you guys will quiet quicker. Uh, hello, my name is Steve McConnell and I am one of the pastors here at Church of the Palms. It's my delight to welcome you here this evening and to especially welcome uh, our new friend, Pete Wainer. Uh, who has come to us from Washington, D.C. Uh, today and found his way to Sarasota, and uh, I think it agrees with him, so, so that's, that's good. And February in Sarasota always agrees with people, so we're uh, delighted that he is here with us. We've had a wonderful dinner, and in a moment I'll take some time to introduce him to you. Uh, this is our community speaker series. For some of you, this may be uh, your first time to visit us, uh, to um, be a part of what has been uh, a growing tradition here at Church of the Palms, which is to invite people from a variety of perspectives uh, who have been uh, important and leading voices in different parts of our culture as we have um, sought to understand at a deeper level uh, what our relationship is to the larger world. How do we bring our faith into the public sphere? And so it has been a joy to hear, uh, as I said, from a variety of perspectives, liberal, conservative, different cultural experiences and such, uh, to help broaden our world and to help us to understand um, the great big kingdom of heaven of which we are a part and how it is that we can be faithful witnesses in our present time. I believe you may have been handed a, um, a little form for you to fill out that would give us uh, an indication that you would like to be on our mailing list or would like to receive communication from Church of Palms, especially relative to this uh, speaker series. And uh, so please uh, let us get that. I think it, you can drop that off. I believe they're in the back somewhere on your way out the door or as you're making your way over to the campus center to uh, meet uh, Mr. Wainer after our time together. And I guarantee you that if you fill out that card, you will be on the mailing list until Jesus returns. No, I'm only kidding. Um, uh, we will not hound you, but we will make you aware of uh, coming, upcoming speakers, including Jen Hatmaker. Um, we have been anxious for Jen to be with us. She was supposed to be with us just before COVID, uh, or just as COVID was descending upon us. And um, we've had to put that off, off, off for the last couple of years. But our hope is that she will be with us on November the 16th, 2022 this year. So uh, keep that in mind. And again, we'll make you aware of not only her, but we have uh, in process a number of speakers for this upcoming, uh, for 2023, that uh, we're very excited about. We're not ready to announce them until we uh, get all that arranged, but we will make sure that you learn uh, sooner than later. We are live streaming this event, and so we're grateful and uh, to welcome those of you who are uh, joining us live stream. It will be recorded, and we'll put that on our website following uh, this time. So if uh, there's parts you want to go back to, then uh, Pete's been so gracious to allow that um, to be the case. So we're grateful. Um, following my introduction, following prayer and then an introduction, um, uh, Mr. Wainer will speak to us for a period of time, and then following that, uh, he and I will have uh, a conversation, sort of a Q&A up here, uh, uh, based upon what he's talked about or even some material that he's written in the past. And then following that, we will invite you to go over to the Campus Center and uh, where uh, he will be available to sign any books that you might have brought or at least to greet you and, um, and for you to have a chance to express your uh, appreciation for his uh, time with us. So let me pray for us. Thanks, O oh God, for this evening. We are grateful that we, as the people of faith, can be together to wonder about our witness in the world and how we may be um, a, a salt and light for a world that yearns to be so, um, so engaged. We are thankful for our friend here this evening, Pete Wainer, and for his effort to be here. And we pray that you will allow him to be an instrument of your spirit such that we may uh, understand more how it is that we can be your agents in the world. And we ask 
uh, the deep sense of your presence. In Christ's name, amen. Peter Weiner is, uh, is the contributing writer to the New York Times and occasionally the Atlantic Magazine. Many of you have read him in those periodicals. He uh, serves as the senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and uh, has uh, contributed in great ways uh, through that work there. He is a graduate of the University of Washington, go Huskies, um, and uh, he has um, served in the past as the Deputy Director of Speech Writing for President George W. Bush, Director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives, uh, which at dinner he was able to share with us a little bit about what that work has been about. He is the author of The Death of Politics and co-author of The City of Man, uh, which he co-authored with our friend Mike Gerson, who was here a few years ago. Uh, and the two of them worked together in, in the White House in the Bush administration. And he also is a co-author of the book Wealth and Justice with Arthur Brooks. Washington Monthly uh, quoted, uh, is quoted as saying that Pete Weiner is one of the most influential reformed-minded conservatives in America today. And Mary Madeline, uh, writing for Forbes magazine, featured him in the short list of conservatives uh, who are leading educators and practitioners of first principles. So we're grateful uh, to uh, hear Pete's uh, sharing with us about what does it mean for us to be followers of Jesus in this world that is polarized and how we might um, carry out a more faithful witness such that uh, our Lord would be pleased in our witness to the world. So without further ado, would you please welcome Pete Weiner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, Steve, for that lovely uh, introduction. Uh, I was director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives, but in the White House of George W. Bush, I was referred to the director of the Office of Strategery, um, which, uh, uh, which, which we said without laughing, which uh, tells you about the locution that we had uh, back then. Uh, so it's great, great to be with you, uh, Steve. Thanks for for having me uh, and, uh, and, and uh, inviting me down. Uh, I think I picked up about uh, 50 degrees between McLean, uh, Virginia and Sarasota, Florida. Um, and um, I, I'd love to say, I think I overdressed, <laughs> but uh, um, I also wanted to thank Pam, who, who has been so kind in coordinating things. And um, for the folks, we had a, we had a lovely dinner uh, earlier. And it's, it's clear that, uh, that this is a church which has uh, ministers of grace and our healing agents um, in a world that, um, that, that, uh, that needs it. So uh, you all should, should be proud in the best way, I think, of what this church is doing and, and what you're doing for, uh, for this community and the wider, wider world. This evening, I want to uh, speak on the topic of uh, Christianity's role in strengthening American society and American democracy. And I, I do think the topic is, is timely because our divisions are um, so deep and so daunting. Um, as everyone here knows, in 2020, we experienced one of the most difficult um, and divisive years um, in our history. We faced a once in a century uh, pandemic, racial unrest, uh, protests in the streets, a deeply contentious election, uh, and in early um, January of last year, an unprecedented attack of political violence in which the citadel of democracy, the US Capitol, uh, was desecrated and people died. Even public health measures in the midst uh, of a pandemic, measures like wearing masks, social distancing, and vaccines have become symbols of America's culture wars. And survey data confirms that we're seeing intense partisan divisions and animosity. Partisan views of the opposing party are now more negative than at any point uh, in memory. Knowledgeable observers are saying the nation is confronting the greatest strain to its fundamental cohesion since the Civil War. Uh, majorities in both parties express not just unfavorable, but very unfavorable views of the other party. A sizable shares of both Democrats and uh, Republicans say the other party stirs feelings, not just of frustration, but of fear uh, and of anger. Studies tell us that Democrats and Republicans both say that the other party's members are hypocritical, selfish, closed-minded, and they're unwilling to socialize across party lines. 
These trends were happening even before the nation was uh, waylaid by COVID-19, so there's something deeper that's going on. Issues having to do with our soul and our spirit, uh, confusion of purpose, a breakdown in human relationships, and human intimacy. Uh, as a friend of mine put it to me, there's a feeling that we're at each other's throats. There's no sense of pride in being part of anything and no sense of belonging. So for the purposes of, um, of this lecture, I'll focus on the role of the Christian church in general and the American evangelical world in particular uh, that uh, is those two are playing in our common life. Um, and I'll do so because that is the world that I know the best. It's the faith community that I've spent the most uh, much, much of my life uh, a part of, uh, and evangelicals make up fully one quarter of the U.S. population, so what happens within that subculture matters to the rest um, of the nation. And it's important uh, to point out uh, at the outset um, something that's important to me um, and, uh, and I think to say, which is that millions of individual Christians are doing remarkable work to care for those living in the shadows um, of society. They're healing our nation's wounds. Most people of the Christian faith um, that I know are decent and honorable people, good citizens, and I'm indebted to the people in the Christian faith who have helped me, they've shaped me, and they've come alongside of me in times of hardship uh, and, uh, and of grief. But in terms of our common life, our civic life, our political life, there is, uh, I would submit, a breakdown. Much of what's being done by evangelical Christians, uh, not all by any means, and not all of it by only one side, is damaging our civic fabric and undermining the public witness of Christianity. If I had to boil down my concerns to a single sense, it would be this. In too many cases, followers of Jesus are subordinating Christian faith to partisan loyalties and the quest for political power. And in doing so, they're often using methods and means that are fundamentally at odds with what the American theologian Eugene Peterson called the Jesus way. Peterson argued that the American church is enamored with the truth of Jesus, but ignores the methods by which Jesus embodied that truth. Christianity is obviously not just about affirming a particular creed or set of dogmas, but following the ways of Jesus, modeling one's ways and one's means after his. That goes for every area uh, of our lives, including politics and cultural engagement. According to Peterson, we can't suppress the Jesus way in order to sell the Jesus truth. The Jesus way and the Jesus truth must be congruent. When they're not, we need to turn things around. Followers of Jesus need to light candles instead of simply curse the darkness. And there are things that can be done writ small and writ large. Some of them are connected to politics, many of them are not, but together they can influence our culture and our wider society for the better. Uh, so with that in mind, here are some suggestions for how faith, and specifically the Christian faith, can be a healing force in American society and strengthen American democracy. First, we need to articulate and show that we take seriously uh, Christian anthropology. And what I mean by that is that we need to demonstrate to a watching world in a compelling and persuasive way that we're made in the image of God and that others, including those with whom we disagree, are also made in the image of God. The Latin term imago dei has its roots in Genesis when we're told that God created men and women in his own image. This scriptural passage implies that we humans are in the image of God in our moral, in our spiritual and in our intellectual nature. And each of us has inestimable worth and inherent dignity. There are special qualities of human nature which allow God to be manifest in each of us. The great distinctive of Christian involvement in public life should be to care for all, for those within our political and religious tribe and those without. There should be no one on the outside treated as an alien or subhuman, including, and even especially, the poor and the weak, the dispossessed and the abused, the wounded traveler on the road to Jericho. Think about how profoundly better things would be if we showed the world that we won't pass on the other side. Second, 
Christians need to model listening well. We need to listen in order to learn, not just listen in order uh, to respond. We know that to successfully communicate with people who hold views different than we do, they need to feel heard, to feel others are showing a genuine interest in them. It isn't effective to lecture people or to marshal facts in an effort to overwhelm them. Uh, if you don't believe me, try it. Uh, you're not gonna change many minds. And it certainly doesn't work to make others feel insulted or dishonored or under attack. We need to show a real interest in others, which builds trust, which in turn builds bridges. But it goes deeper than that. There is such a thing as collective wisdom, and we're better off if we have within our orbit people who see the world somewhat differently uh, than we do. As, our, as iron sharpens iron, the book of Proverbs says, so one person sharpens another. Um, that's an easy concept to embrace in the abstract. Um, I find it more difficult to, to uh, embrace uh, in, in, in the here and the now and in the real world. But it's something that I think we really need to do. And it requires us to actually engage with and carefully listen to people who understand things in ways that are dissimilar to how we do. It means we have to venture out of our philosophical and theological cul-de-sac from time to time, but it's worth the effort. We also need to see those with whom we disagree in mid-story and see ourselves in mid-story as well. None of us, none of us are completed works. We might keep in mind too what has been said of Pope Francis. He's an evangelist, not an activist. He believes in counter, in encounter rather than confrontation. Third, people of the Christian faith should model what it means to debate and disagree well. All of us can do better at viewing debate, less as an arena for conquest and more as an arena for learning. Let me explain what I mean. Um, C.S. Lewis, and, uh, when uh, Steve and I were chatting, I saw a lot of C.S. Lewis books in your uh, office. I imagine he probably makes his way into uh, your sermons from time to time. To time. Um, actually, Kathy Keller, is the wife of Tim Keller, is a prominent uh, pastor, uh, once uh, said to, to my wife Cindy and me that if you hear Tim quoting C.S. Lewis several times in a sermon, it means he didn't prepare the sermon uh, because it was, it was his, it was his go-to, uh, go-to guy. But that's true of me too. Lewis was a, was a big influence uh, on, on me very early in my Christian journey. Um, but Lewis um, in uh, Surprised by Joy, uh, which is his spiritual autobiography, uh, refers there uh, to his childhood friend, Arthur Greaves, as his first friend. And he refers to the philosopher and the poet, Owen Barfield, as his second friend. Uh, the first friend, according to Lewis, is one's alter ego. That's the person who first reveals to you that you are not alone in the world by turning out to share all of your most secret delights. There is nothing to be overcome in making him your friend. He and you join like raindrops on a window. It's a lovely description. A second friend is the person who, in the words of Lewis, disagrees with you about everything. He's not so much the alter ego as the anti-self. Of course he shares your interests, otherwise he would not have become your friend at all. But he has approached them at a different angle. He's read all the right books, but has got all the wrong things out of every one. It is as if he spoke your language, but mispronounced it. How can he be so nearly right and yet invariably just not right? Lewis went on to say, when you set out to correct his heresies, you find that he forsooth to correct yours. And then you go at it, hammer and tong, far into the night, night after night, each learning the weight of the other's punches, often more like mutually respectful enemies than friends. Actually, though it never seems so at the time, you modify one another's thoughts. And out of this perpetual dogfight, a community of mind and deep affection emerge. Now, here's what's striking, which is that both Lewis and Barfield treasured their relationship 
precisely because they helped each other see things that they would otherwise have been blind to. They felt like uh, that they helped each other widen the aperture when it came to seeing truth. In argument, Barfield said later, we always, both of us, were arguing for the truth, not for victory. Just to repeat that line, in argument, we always, both of us, were arguing for the truth, not for victory. That is a very, very different way to engage in, in dialogue with, uh, with, with people. Are you, are you seeking to learn uh, or are you seeking to win? Um, if we could move closer to the Lewis Barfield model of dialogue and debate, we'd all be better off, and it would certainly help us think of our national politics as something other than a fight to the death. Fourth, Christians should model humility and epistemic modesty. Uh, over breakfast a few years ago with a friend of mine, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, I asked John what constructive contribution Christians could make to public life uh, John's a low-voltage atheist, uh, but he finds much to admire in religion. And he answered me very simply. He said, humility. My own understanding of humility is inextricably tied to a decades-long journey of faith. <clears throat> From it, I've become convinced that Christians should be characterized by humility. That doesn't mean followers of Jesus, Jesus should be indifferent to a moral order grounded in eternal truths, are unable to judge some things right and others wrong, but they ought to be alert first and foremost to their own shortcomings, to the awareness of how wayward our own hearts are, how even good acts are often tainted by selfish motives, how we all struggle with brokenness in our lives. This is not an argument for self-loathing, it's an argument for self-awareness. At the core of Christian doctrine is the belief that we've all fallen short that our loves are disordered and our lives are sometimes a mess, and therefore we are in need of grace. As a result, one of the defining characteristics of a Christian's witness to the world should be gentleness, an ironic spirit, and empathy. The mark of genuine humility is not self-abasement as much as it is self-forgetting, which in turn allows us to take an intense interest in the lives of others. In my last uh, conversation with him before he died in 2015, Steve Hayner, uh, who was president of, at Columbia Theological Seminary and an enormously influential figure in my life, we talked a little bit about Steve uh, at, at uh, dinner, uh, he put it well, I believe in objective truth, Steve told me, but I hold lightly to our ability to perceive truth. And what Steve meant by this, I think, is that the world is unfathomably complex. To believe we have mastered it in all respects, that our angle of vision on matters like politics and philosophy and theology is just right all the time is ridiculous. That doesn't mean that one ought to live in a state of perpetual doubt and uncertainty. If we did, we could never speak up for justice and moral truth. It does mean, however, that we're aware that what we know is at best incomplete. We see through a glass darkly, is how St. Paul put it in one of his letters to the Corinthians. We know only in part. My point isn't that humility is uniquely available to Christians. It is simply that Christian teaching and tradition affirms its importance. None of us sees the truth in its totality, and all of us need the eyes and ears of others, friends, writers, those from earlier ages, to help us in that journey. Fifth, we should model trust in God. Those of us who believe in a sovereign God should be the least angry, the least anxious, the least fearful. One of the most frequently repeated commands in the Bible is fear not. It's not that there aren't real threats, of course. We all know that there are. Uh, and it's not that these threats might not understandably elicit fear. The point of the fear not injunction, at least as I understand them, is for us to know deep in our hearts that God is the author and finisher of our stories, both individually and collectively. He invites us to a calm trust. Apocalyptic and hysterical rhetoric is inappropriate for people who are children of the king, according to James Forsyth, senior pastor at Cedar Springs Presbyterian Church in Knoxville. Christians should not be characterized by white knuckles of fear and terror, but too many of us are. God's kingdom has a set of values that should shape us and instill a sense of mission, but God's purpose ultimately doesn't hinge on us. 
We can rest in the knowledge that God is in control and that things will unfold according to his will and ways. And that allows all of us to hold a bit more lightly to the things of this world. Sixth, we should model grace. Here we can learn from the author Philip Yancey, who in his marvelous book, What's So Amazing About Grace, uh, was written in 1996-97, said this, Grace comes free of charge to people who do not deserve it, and I'm one of those people. I think back to who I was, resentful, wound tight with anger, a single hardened link in a long chain of ungrace learned from family and church. Now I'm trying in my own small way to pipe the tune of grace. I do so because I know more surely than I know anything that any pang of healing or forgiveness uh, of goodness or goodness I have ever felt comes solely from the grace of God. I yearn for the church to become a nourishing culture of that grace. Here's a more contemporary example. Seven years ago, nine African Americans were gunned down at a Bible study at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. You may remember that. And the gunman, Dylan Roof, was a racist. Less than 48 hours after the killing, the victim's families were allowed to speak directly to Roof at the first court appearance. The family members spoke in honest, moving, unaffected ways about their grief and about their heartache. Yet they also bestowed forgiveness upon the man who had killed their loved ones. It was an extraordinary moment. These Christians vividly demonstrated how forgiveness can result uh, not just in healing, uh, but also political change. Within days of their courtroom appearance, then South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley endorsed removing the Confederate flag from the state grounds, and within weeks the state legislature voted to take it down. People who would not have reversed course under the threat of boycotts or political attacks changed their minds after amazing acts of grace. Division gave way to unity because a group of wounded Christians elevated the sight and spirit of everyone around them. The greatest and most powerful Christian distinctive is not the exercise of power, it is uh, the offer of grace. And I should say that when that happened, that moment uh, with the arraignment with Dylan Roof and those families, um, I sent a link of, of that to a friend of mine. He's a Jewish, uh, he's atheist, and he's gay. And um, when I sent it to him, he wrote me back, and he said, in effect, um, I've never really understood um, the concept of grace, but this act helps me understand it better than I would have understood it um, before. And, I, and I've, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. And there, there are times in which um, these kind of moments or certain acts of human kindness or certain people embodying a um, uh, certain kind of character um, makes him feel as if he's missing something by not being a Christian. The way he describes himself as he said, for me, faith, I feel colorblind. I feel like people of faith see color and I don't. Um, but at least he, there are times in which he sees these acts of grace where he longs to, to see the colors of, uh, of life. Now in saying all of what I, I have about grace, I want to emphasize that in offering it, in offering grace, in listening well to others, and in showing proper humility, we shouldn't be indifferent to telling the truth or calling out untruths or fail to criticize what deserves criticism or stay silent in the face of wrongdoing. Christians aren't called to be passive in the face of maliciousness. That's not the Jesus way either. Now, here's a question for all of you to ponder. Just what might it mean for Christians to be on the margins of political and cultural power? And what opportunities are there for the Christian church as a kind of cultural minority? We're certainly not used to thinking in those terms. Many of us have been conditioned to think only of the harm that attends uh, to loss of cultural and political power. But there are other ways to think about this. I asked Yuval Levin, uh, who's Jewish uh, and therefore part of a minority faith in America uh, and is a close friend of mine, uh, for his thoughts on how Christians might approach these matters and what they might learn from uh, people of the Jewish faith. And he told me that the inability to any longer see yourself as in possession of institutions and cultural power and political power can actually be clarifying and empowering to say this is our country should mean that we are part of a larger society to which we owe something and to which we can contribute something, Yuval told me. He's a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. 
He went on to say, but it's not necessarily, necessarily to say that my way of life is dominant here and it, that in that sense it is mine. And that forces you to try to be persuasive rather than demanding. When you try to be persuasive, you try to be attractive. And that also makes you more effective. It also helps you see what you owe your neighbors. The Jewish women's volunteer group Hadassah has a motto that Yuval has always loved. We help people not because they're Jewish. We help people because we're Jewish. He thinks that's the right way to think about what it is we're offering as religious people to a larger society that often isn't where Jews are. And Yuval points out that being a minority is not the worst thing in the world, and it's certainly not the worst thing in America. Actually, much strength comes from that. It enables one to be persuasive, which, after all, is what people who are trying to change souls want to be, and to see not only the loss of social power, but the potential persuasive power of speaking from a place where you say, I know you don't agree with me, but I think you should, and here's why that can strengthen you in ways that we should recognize. That's not to deny that some things of importance will be lost, but there is also a lot to gain in this kind of set of circumstances. He also told me, uh, pre-pandemic, that an overriding social challenge of this period is isolation and loneliness, so religious communities should see that they have a special role to play in meeting people's needs. What religious communities can offer is not just a kind of philosophy of life, but community, unified by a deep commitment to the truth and a vision of the good. And I think religious traditionalists should see that this is what most people are missing now. They need to emphasize the communal character of what they have to offer because that is likely to be especially attractive and especially powerful. What Yuval means by this is we would be far better and more effective if we spoke about what we seek to protect and to portray what we love in a way that is more beautiful and more attractive. Uh, a few years ago, Mark Labberton, the president of Fuller Theological Seminary and, and, and a good friend of mine, delivered a lecture that helped me to see things in a different way uh, than I had in the past. In the lecture, he offers a distinctive way for Christians to conceive of their calling from people who see themselves as living in a promised land and demanding it back to living a faithful, exilic life. It's a very different approach, creating different expectations and understanding of our situation, our place, our posture, and our purpose. Mark speaks about what it means to live as people in exile, trying to find the capacity to love in unexpected ways, to see the enemy, the foreigner, the stranger, and the alien, and to go toward them rather than away from them. He asks what a life of faithfulness looks like while living in a world of fear. In the lecture, uh, Mark recounts remarkable stories of people creatively, courageously, and faithfully engaging in the world. The woman who lost 41 relatives in the Rwandan civil war and yet finds a way to extend grace amidst the toxicity and bitterness, the resentment, and the hatred. The woman and her guild who made beautiful quilts for those traumatized and suffering in hospitals in eastern Congo, showing there was a place for beauty even in the context of utter dislocation and violence. The church that held traditional beliefs on human sexuality tending to the AIDS garden in Golden Gate Park with humility, love, kindness, and compassion, and in the process, developing understanding, trust, and meaningful relationships. An African-American student bearing witness to a racial reality he faces that would otherwise go unseen by others. Egyptians on the Fuller campus who, in the aftermath of an ISIS killing of Christians in Egypt, turned a memorial service into a celebration of those who were martyred. Mark concludes his lecture this way. The reason this enterprise of culture care is so critical is because it awakens us. As the artist Maku Fujimura often says, no longer talking in terms of culture war, but culture care. Culture care is an expression of faithful, exilic life. How do we actually show up building houses, planting gardens, loving and seeking justice, being people who seek the shalom of our enemy fortress? for it's in that shalom that we will find our shalom. These are calls to a different set of instincts, and I hope we acknowledge we are in a period where the tectonic plates are shifting, where the church is, 
in one of its deepest moments of crisis, not because of some election result or not, but because of what has been exposed to be the poverty of the American church and its capacity to be able to see and to love and to serve and to engage in ways in which we simply fail to do. And that vocation is the vocation that must be recovered and must be made real in tangible action. I'll close with a final thought. I've spent my entire life in politics and I, I don't regret having done so um, for a moment. I understand politics has uh, downsides and, and dark sides, which is simply to say that it's a human enterprise um, like every other one on earth. But it matters and it should matter to people of faith. The reason is that politics is at the end of the day when all is said and done about pursuing justice, even if imperfectly, and justice always matters. So my encouragement to others, and especially to the younger generation, is don't withdraw from politics, but do find a better way to engage with it. The political culture mo movement I have in mind will require Christians to make a compelling case for social order and moral excellence, but done with the generosity of spirit, all the while offering a healing touch. It will require Christians to be less fearful and more hopeful, less anxious and more confident that God is sovereign and his purposes don't ultimately rest on our efforts. Christians engaged in public life should model calm trust rather than panic and vitriol, born of anxiety. We are called to be faithful, not successful. So keep a critical distance, be willing to speak truth to power, hold on to timeless principles, seek the welfare of the city to which you've been called, don't compromise your integrity in exchange for access to power. The words of Martin Luther King Jr. are instructive. The church should be reminded that it's not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If we understand even moments of cultural challenge and weakness in the right way, if we show joy and grace, serenity and hope, even while traveling on roads marked by difficulty, these moments can turn out to be not a calamity, but a greater and grander stage for the true, enduring, and life-giving message of the gospel, which is, after all, what we're called to bear witness to. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Pete, and thank you, James and Ryan. For... Thanks, guys. <clears throat> uh, thank you. It was wonderful and uh, helpful for us. And I um, want to talk to you a little bit more about your understanding of uh, the local church. And um, I think one of the struggles that I observe um, in local churches across the country is the Christian witness uh, toward justice. Uh -huh. um, that um, so often um, people want to shy away from because they feel like it too quickly um, falls into the issue of politics right. and partisanship. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've always said that uh, ministries of mercy are what the church often excels at. Right. But ministries of justice are yes. um, not are, are ministries that the church can sometimes shy away from. So, right. what what are your thoughts about that, and how have you seen uh, congregations and churches deal with that uh, very thin line sometimes between partisan rancor about justice and then the call of Jesus to justice? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a great question, and and you're and you're right. I I, I think that the ministry of mercy is um, I'm not sure I'd say it's easier because it requires a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice. It, it is less controversial. There are just fewer fewer landmines. Um, the the issue of of justice I think is is tricky um, because there's often not always, but there's often a connection between politics of justice for the reasons that I mentioned in the talk tonight, which is politics is about a lot of things, but ultimately it's about, it's about justice. And the, James Madison writes about that in the Federalist uh, papers. And I mean, there's a whole body of thought throughout 
political theory, which is the, which is the notion of um, of justice. And so, anytime you begin to to touch on issues that have political connotations within a church, that can be divisive for the church um, because you have people with different, often different views in the church. Um, but sometimes the ch church is fairly monolithic in its in its views, but but uh, but not always. Um, and then I think it's, it's a matter of, of discretion and discernment. I have always tended to be, throughout my life, somebody who has been very, very wary of pastors using their positions, certainly from the pulpit, um, to speak out on politics. Um, and uh, you probably will, you may appreciate this, a lot of friends of mine who are pastors do, which is if you speak out about something on Sunday, January 12th, about justice that has a political connotation. There are gonna be certain people in that conversation that hear what you say in a certain way. So when you talk about Philippians 2 on Sunday, January 19th, they're not gonna to listen to you because they'll have said, well, this person's a liberal or this person's a conservative or whatever. And then they just tune you out sort of on, on everything you say. On the other hand, justice matters. The Bible is filled, I mean, you, you can't, go five pages in the Hebrew scriptures without coming across justice, it seems like, at least in certain, certain books. Um, and we have to speak to it. Um, the pastors that I've seen do, who have done it best are not partisan, are not political, tend not to speak about candidates, or political figures. They offer in good faith a frame of how to understand justice and certain moments that need to be understood within that frame, within that context. It doesn't tell them how to think or how to vote, but it does uh, tell them that this is a matter of importance, it gives them something to focus on, and as a minister like, like you, to be able to say, this is what the Bible teaches about this. These are the principles that matter to be faithful people, but then to let individuals work, work that, uh, work that uh, out in real life. So for example, caring for the poor and the dispossessed and the weak is certainly a biblical concept, but that doesn't mean that if there's a welfare reform bill that's coming up, that you as a pastor have to weigh in for or against it. Um, for one thing, most pastors I know aren't really particularly competent to speak to public policy. Uh, that's not what they spend their, 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 uh, their, their life in. And having said that, um, you know, there's an important qualifier. I guess we could call it the Bonhoeffer qualifier. Um, there are certain times and moments of such moral urgency and political urgency slash moral urgency that the church might well need and pastors may, may well need to speak to that, to that moment. Um, and different people will understand when that moment is. I mean, we look back at Bonhoeffer as a martyr and as a, as a great figure because he took a stand, as, as you know, I mean, the German church was corrupted and it was basically the German national church was used by the Nazis to advance Nazism. And Bonhoeffer, uh, with a few others, um, stood against it, w wasn't particularly successful, um, but he was a person of principle, right? What I said earlier, you don't have to be successful, you have to be principled. So there's that. If you were in South Africa in the 1980s and the Dutch Reformed Church was part of the apartheid regime, would one have an obligation to speak then? Uh, what about the Civil War? Mark Knoll has a fantastic book, small book, relatively small, called The Theological Crisis of the Civil War, where you had abolitionists and people in the South proof texting Bible, was that something we, that where pastors should have spoke? Should Martin Luther King, who was a minister above, above all else, and you know, spoke beautifully, uh, really preached in his public, should he have spoken? Um, so the, those, those moments matter. And then the difficulty, I honestly just, you know, to, for some people, the Trumpian moment was one of those moments where some people thought something is happening and Christians need to speak out something that is a kind of moral urgency and that, that, uh, that justice is at stake and this is one of those moments. Other people said, no, uh, you know, I have my views on them, you have your views. 
you know, Hillary Clinton we might have different views on, Barack Obama. I don't want the church or my pastor or, or others to, to weigh in. And that's just a difference that honorable and, and, and honest people can, uh, can, can have. So I think the, 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 the disposition should be to be certainly wary about getting involved in politics and partisan politics. Don't shy away from, from justice, but how you connect justice to particular moments in time um, really depends, I would say, on the, on the pastor, on the congregation, and the moment in time. Thanks. Um, talk a bit about um, Christian nationalism, um, <clears throat> which seems to be a reality that probably, again, every congregation is, and every pastor and every um, any group of Christians really kind of struggle with in terms of, you know, marrying the, the Christian um, church to a particular um, nationalistic view. And, you know, how have you seen that evolve over time? To what degree has the church taken the bait on that? And, yeah. you know, how, just yeah. your, your own thoughts. I mean, my thoughts is it's a problem. Um, I've, I've never really... Uh, theologically, honestly, understood the appeal of Christian nationalism, as, as we're, certainly as we're seeing it today, just because I didn't think of Jesus as a particularly nationalistic figure. I felt I viewed him as somebody who sort of crossed boundaries and broke down dividing walls and was such a figure in saying, you know, with the Samaritans and the Jews and was always trying to get away from a kind of identity politics, if you will, to be able to say, see the other person as a human being with dignity, bridge these differences, learn from other, from other, uh, from other people. That's just the, the shaping influences I, I, uh, that, that I've come from. I'm not pretending that they're better than anybody else's. It's just how I've read Jesus and I've read and I've read the, read, the, read the gospel. I mean, I was horrified by the images on January 6th of the people who used Christian nationalism. It was basically the cross and the gallows. Right as these people were, were, were there. I thought it was deeply destructive to the Christian witness, which, which, um, which is the most, I would say, personally painful thing to me about how I, th I think uh, politics in this era has done a lot of damage to, to, to the Christian witness. I was a good friend of mine, Carl Coppock, who was instrumental in my faith, my, my uh, early journey of faith. And I saw him just a couple of years ago, I was back home visiting and we had breakfast and he was talking about the effect of the, the conjunction between Christianity and politics and, and nationalism. And he said, Pete, it's a generational catastrophe, what, what's happening to, to, to you, particularly younger, you know, younger, uh, younger Christians. Um, I would say, uh, in addition to that, maybe on a, on, to go, but maybe a level deeper, um, I'll tell you, Steve, I think one of the things that I've, I've learned um, maybe more vividly and forcefully than I knew earlier was the degree to which I think um, for most of us, maybe for all of us, um, our core identities, we think our core identities, as people of Christian faith, we think our core identities are, are much more based on Christianity than I think in reality they often are. And I think that what's happened a lot is that culture and sociology and partisan politics have caused faith to be subordinated. We talk as Christians as if being followers of Jesus is the most important thing in our life. And in some respects it is, and certainly a lot of people believe that. I think in reality, in ways that we're blind to, we've subordinated it. And there are issues of sociology, of culture, um, of partisanship which are most core to our identity. And then as people of Christian faith, we go out and we use the Bible to proof text or support, support what we already believe. I had a conversation with Francis Collins, uh, who was former director of NIH and Deb Harzma recently. And the topic of the conversation was the battle between faith and science. And I said, Francis, um, I don't think about it as so much as a battle between faith and science. Uh, particularly in the, in the context of the pandemic, I said, I think about it as a battle between sociology and science or culture and science or politics and science. 
but we've put over the umbrella term, you know, of faith. So I think a lot of people, for a variety of complicated reasons, have a tropism disposition toward nationalism, and they are people who are Christian, and that may be because they've, they've had a journey like Lewis, or it could be because they grew up in regions of the country where you were just culturally Christian. Um, and latched Christianity onto these, uh, onto these other things. And we should never underestimate the tremendous power of group identification. All of us identify with groups, all of us are a product of the people we're around, the people who influence us, the people that, that we respect. Um, and group uh, uh, identity uh, or groups offer us a sense of identity and a sense of self-esteem. And if you ask an individual to stand up uh, to the people who are part of his community or her community or group, you're asking a lot of them. Um, there are a few people now and then that do it, but it's rare than it is, um, than it is common. Hmm. Um, in your book, you uh, quote Robert Aaron, I believe his name is, Freedom Flourishes in Temperate Zones. Yeah. Um, and it was a part of your discussion about moderation. Um, <clears throat> and I wonder about that in terms of, you know, politics in, in maybe its purest form invites moderation, invites compromise. Um, and yet, you know, in our religious faith, we're often taught to not compromise and, um, and to, you know, hold on to the, you know, these truths to which we ascribe. And I guess I'm wondering about how is it that those two worlds can come together? Because I wonder sometimes, um, you know, as Christians, we are taught to sort of dig in our heels about our faith. And yet then the political world invites us to be moderate in, in terms of our approach with one another. And it's almost as if you would need to reverse those, that the political yeah. world can teach the religious world something about how do we go about our faith in moderate ways um, such that we could hear one another. But y your thoughts about all that? Yeah, was, these are really, these are really good questions. Um, I, I, I would say that politics invites compromise in the American expression of, of it. Um, politics historically has not invited compromise it's actually become, um, like so many other areas of life, a place where passions and anger plays out. It's why the, why the history of the world is, is often one marked by, by bloodshed and division and war. So I would say, you know, one of the great insights of the founders was they, they were people of varying degrees of faith. Uh, they weren't all Christians by any means. Most of them were deists. Some I think went through the motions of being deists. But what they did have, in my understanding of the founders, um, and there's a new book actually, uh, a very good book by a professor at Wheaton uh, that, that just came out uh, on this topic, which is they believed that human nature was fallen, that, it was a, that, that human nature was, was a complicated mix of vice and virtue. But they set up a system of government through checks and balances, through the separation of powers. Um, they, they, they were keenly aware, particularly Madison, of the, of the passions. And so what they wanted our political system to do, the reason that it's slower than a lot of people like, is to calm the passions. Because that's not the natural state of politics for human beings. So what you have to do is you have to construct a political system that takes human nature as it is and channels it in constructive rather than destructive ways. And for the most part, the American experiment has done that, certainly not always. But as a conception, um, I think it, it, has, it has worked. And you're right, compromise in the American understanding of, 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 of government is a virtue for precisely the reason that, that uh, that you, that you said, I do think that faith, I mean, you know, when John Locke was writing, Locke was the most influential figure intellectually, I would say, on the founders. Um, Europe had just come out of a couple of centuries of religious wars. They were very, very worried about what faith conjoining with politics would do. 
which is why they created some distance between politics and, um, and faith. Because if you're in politics, that already evokes certain passions. If you overlay that, a, a faith that pushes you away from compromise and toward a, a, you know, a, a, an us or them kind of war mentality, that additional fuel can be, can be explosive. The flip side of that is if faith can, can, can bring qualities in people that makes them more decent, more civil peacemakers, then you can make the political system, uh, system better. I agree with you. I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I, I suppose it depends in some respects on, on obviously what community one is part of, what denomination one is a part of, what one's faith journey is. But there are certainly a lot of people, very close friends of mine, who view faith just very much as you said, which is they're very quick to look for people that they believe are compromising on principle. There's a difference between being in principle for compromise and compromising on principle. And I think they often get, they often get, get confused. I, I would say from a theological perspective, um, we're all much more relativistic in what we decide are issues of compromise and not. You know, you, you hear this a lot from, I would say, a more conservative evangelical view, which is a lot of times that they'll say, you know, if you compromise on this, you're on the slippery slope. If you, if you compromise on this teaching, the entire authority of scripture collapses. That, by the way, in my experience, is why if you have a discussion with people on, let's say, the ordination of women, I mean, there's so many issues you could choose. Um, and, uh, and you feel like there's a particular energy behind that debate. Sometimes it's not because of that issue. It's because that issue is a proxy for the authority of Scripture. So people feel like, I'm going to win this argument because if I lose this argument, my faith is going to, going to collapse. But in fact, all of us compromise on all sorts of teachings in the Bible. You know, uh, we, we're just selective in what we decide, okay, this teaching is, is a hill to die on. This one was culture-specific. This one is, is timeless. And how do we choose what is the hill to die on and what's not? I think a lot of that is disposition and temperament, communities that we've been a part of, um, and, and a lot of other things. We think we kind of come at it and we think, well, we're reading the scriptures in an honest way and it's very clear what it teaches. And in fact, you talk to people, in, if you were able to talk to people in other eras, or if you talk to people in other countries, they'll tell you a very, very different interpretation. Then you say, well, you know what? I'm shaped by my experience. They're shaped by their experience. So let's hopefully learn from, from one another. Thank you. Um, what should our relationship be to the media? To the media? Uh, well, it's, I, I suppose it depends on which media you have. You know, other than your columns. Other than my columns. Uh, um, yeah, it depends on which, I suppose, which media you have in mind and, 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 who, uh, and who one, one, uh, one is. I mean, my, I'll, I'll give you my own views on, on, on the media, I would say, as a general, you know, as a general matter. And maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, faith as it relates to my story and, and, and the... Uh, and the media. I'd say as a general matter, um, I'm a lifelong, uh, I've been a lifelong conservative uh, and up until the Trump moment was a lifelong Republican. I broke for the, from the party over that just to get sort of my cards on the table, but I'm still a philosophical conservative. Um, I, I, I've got a huge number of friends who are journalists and reporters. For the most part, I, I like them. I respect that the job that they do. A few I don't. I can think of people who covered us, for example, in the White House. Most of them, I thought, were, were, were good, serious, honest reporters. We had a couple that had an agenda um, that, was, that I think was, was, uh, was pretty clear. I do think that the media plays a pretty important part in, 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 in this country um, to try and keep people in power accountable because in every realm of, of human life that I can think of, including and sometimes especially the church, if there's not accountability, if there's not, you know, the Justice Brandeis line, sunlight is the best disinfectant. If people are living their lives uh, or, or uh, institutionally uh, things are being kept in the shadows, 
a lot of trouble happens. Um, and the, you know, the purpose of the media is to keep it out. The media has a mixed record in this country. I mean, if you go back to the early years of the Republic, yellow journalism, you know, it was as, as bad as it, it, or in some respects worse than it is than it is uh, now. I'd say as a general matter, there is, in my, uh, my sense of things, has there been a somewhat of a liberal bias in the media, mainstream media, I would say for sure, particularly on cultural issues. Um, there's a ton of evidence from the views of reporters, you know, that would show that. The reporters would say, well, my personal views are, are liberal, but it doesn't make its way into, into my reporting. To which I would say it probably makes its way into your reporting more than you, than you would imagine, especially in the story selection and how you frame issues. Um, but I would say that the right-wing media today is more of a threat to, to the republic than, than the mainstream media, I would say, by, by, a, good, by a good distance. In terms of personally, you know, my own relationship with the media, so I'm a person of the Christian faith um, and pretty open about that in, in, my, in my writings. I was hired to be, not hired, I, I was brought on to be a contributing opinion writer to the New York Times in um, 2015. And the person who recruited me, uh, Aaron Reddick, was, uh, he had had, there was a reporter at the Times who would mention my name, said this is somebody you might want to consider. And they were looking to bring on more conservative voices for the, from the po political side of things. Um, so Aaron recruited me, and, um, we, and we have a very good relationship. Uh, but then I wanted to start writing pieces on faith. And uh, the first piece I wrote was December of 2015, called The Christmas Revolution. And it was on what a revolutionary figure that Jesus was. And since then, I've written, you know, 12 to 15 pieces just in the New York Times. I, I write for the Atlantic magazine as well, which are reflections on Christ and on Christianity. Not the intersection of faith and politics. I've done that too. But I'm talking about the resurrection, the crucifixion, the incarnation, uh, where's God in the midst of pain, grace, humility, um, Jesus' mode of discourse through, through parables and through questions um, in the most important newspaper in the world and what most Christians would say is a very liberal newspaper and which is not a, you know, not a Christian newspaper. And my editor, who's, a, who's an atheist, loves, we were talking about this earlier, loves working on these pieces. And um, I've been completely open about my faith. Um, I'm open about it on social media. I'm open about it in conversations, including on cable news programs. Certainly open about it in, in my writings. And I've never encountered that I can think of any real hostility um, because of it. Um, and um, so, you know, I appreciate the fact that the Times let somebody like me, and I know my editor, I mean, there are times in which there are people there who read it, you know, or part of the Times that think, you know, God, this is, um, <laughs> I remember I got a comment, he passed on a comment to me that someone had made, it was one of my pieces, I forgot which one, on, on Christianity, and one of the people had said, when I read the draft of Pete's column, it reminded me of all of the years that my parents dragged me to church, and I mean that in the worst way possible. <laughs> um, but, but Aaron, you know, has, loves doing those columns and has pushed. I've never had anything rejected on, uh, on, on, uh, on faith. And it's true in the Atlantic, too. Um, I did a, did a long, uh, heavily reported piece in the Atlantic in October on sort of the experience mostly that pastors were having in this moment, the divisions within the church. And it was one of the most read pieces in the Atlantic that year. Um, and my editors want me to keep, you know, keep writing on it. So my own experience with the media is, has been quite good just generally in terms of politics, but also um, I've been very appreciative as a person of faith that I've been pretty welcome in that community. Thanks. Um, so you can read the New York Times, people, just so you know. Um, look for Pete. Um, 
Like, lastly, uh, and maybe more personally, um, you've had the opportunity to be in the halls of government for a period of time of your life and, and be pretty close to the, <clears throat> you know, the halls of power and, um, and politics. How would you say that part of your life shaped you, um, both for the good and for the bad? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, one, <laughs> one way that it shaped me, uh, and one narrow way that it shaped me, or at least helped, I think, my perspective, is uh, I tell people that my IQ was 80 points higher the day before I went in government, and it went up 80 points the day after I left government. Um, because it's a lot easier to look smart as a commentator than it is to be in government for the obvious reason, which is when you're in government, particularly if you're working at the White House, particularly at the higher reaches of the White House, you're dealing with often impossibly complicated issues, many, often with many different issues coming in at one time. You're doing it on a schedule that you may not want, but demands actions. You're getting very smart people giving you competing advice on what to do. You're, tr you're trying to decide policy in a contingent world, trying to anticipate what the actions will be, uh, which is by nature very, very difficult. Um, and, and then when policies are implemented, there's the question of how, how soon do you adjust if you think you're making a mistake or not. And you don't know that until you have the benefit of hindsight. If you, if you have a policy that's a mistake, and you adjust for it, you're viewed as wise, discreet, pragmatic, non-ideological. If you have a decision in which you should have stayed with it because it needed more time to work and you're going through a really hard period and you retreat too quickly, you're viewed as unprincipled, weak, spineless, too willing to bend to the political pressures you should have been a profile in courage. All of that stuff in trying to decide in real time what to do is, um, is, is hard. You know, I, I was having conversations with friends of mine, people who'd worked in, in various previous administrations about if you were the Biden administration with Ukraine now. And I was asking foreign policy experts, you know, what, how do you think Biden did? And, uh, and uh, what should he do going forward? And uh, so I got some feedback. One person said, well, what he probably should have done is he should have sent uh, NATO troops and U.S. troops as a tripwire early on because he said, I, I don't think Putin then would have invaded Ukraine because he wouldn't be willing to go to war with the U.S. and NATO. And I wrote him back and I said, it was a very thoughtful note. And I said, let me just press you a little bit. Just assume you're national security advisor for President Jeb Bush and the Ukraine um, crisis happens. And you tell the president that you wanna put troops in Ukraine, sort of token force as a tripwire. Um, let me ask you national security advisor so-and-so, if President Putin decides to trip that wire are you willing to go to war? Um, maybe he won't, but what if he does? If he does, are you willing to engage in a land war over Ukraine? Are you in, willing to engage in a nuclear war over Ukraine? Because it could easily slip into a nuclear exchange. Or maybe you're going to put troops there as a, as a tripwire to try and keep Putin from going in. But if he decides to go in, and then you decide we're not gonna fight a war over Ukraine, we're gonna retreat, then you shatter the credibility of NATO and the United States in ways much more severe than if you never sent troops there before. So how would you do it now? And, uh, and he didn't really, 
he was rethinking his, his, I just use that as an illustration of how complicated, you know, these things are. And, and I could give you, you know, dozens and dozens of other examples. Then if I pulled the lens back and said, you know, maybe as a Christian, as a, as a person, how have I been affected for, for, for good or not um, in terms of being in the halls of power? Um, I honestly don't know that I would be much fundamentally different one way or the other if I hadn't been there. I, I've always loved being in politics because I felt like politics was a noble profession, not an imperfect profession, uh, perfect profession by any means and not without its own downsides and challenges. Um, but from a time that I was in high school, it fascinated me. I was drawn to it. I was drawn to politics on the idea side, not really particularly on the power side and certainly not on the partisanship side. To, to me, it was, an, it was, a, it was a, an arena in which important ideas and ideals could, 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 be, could be worked out. So it's given me a, lot, a huge amount of, of, of satisfaction, I'd say, personal satisfaction, professional satisfaction. And I do appreciate its open doors for me to write, um, which, which I really, really enjoy doing. I don't think it's made me particularly better um, as, a, as a person. I met some really impressive people. Um, I don't think it's made me particularly worse either. I, my str I have my struggles in life. I don't think, I think the people who know me best would never have said that being seduced by power was particularly one of them. Um, well, like when I left the White House, I had no real particular desire to go, to go back, to go back uh, in, um, and uh, I, I thought before, and I think now that the most important things when it comes to an individual is just the integrity of your daily life and your individual life, um, and and how you treat the people, particularly the people you love people who are part of your, your community, but really others too. It's funny, I remember having this discussion, this may have been a bigger issue when I was growing up than it is today, um, but this was in college and I would have these discussions with people and they were all trying to figure out their, as Christians, their career ambitions. And I remember the formula, roughly the formulation I used. I said, I don't really think God cares a lot about what profession I choose. And he doesn't really care a lot if I stay in Seattle or move to Tuscaloosa or move to Boston. It's not like I'm gonna choose some direction for my life and God is gonna go, oh my gosh, you just, you know, you, you chose the wrong fork in the road. There's nothing that we can do. Uh, my sense is that God just walks the journey with us. The journey takes a thousand twists and turns. And in the end, what will matter is just the integrity of your life um, in, in kind of all of its aspects. None of us are perfect. We've all done things wrong. Um, and, um, you know, I've had a chance to, to play it out in politics. I, I really don't believe that, uh, that, that uh, you know, at, at whatever point I'm, I'm face to face with God, he's going to give a lot, it's going to matter a lot to him what I wrote in The Atlantic. In or the New York Times, you know, in the summer of 2019. I try and write faithfully. I try and write in a way that I hope can move people. I use it to express things I care about. So it matters a lot to me, but I just think, you know, in terms of how I understand Christianity, um, one of the early things we were talking earlier about Malcolm Muggeridge, um, when you and I were, were, were talking, I remember being struck by Muggeridge early in my Christian journey about how he talked about the inversion, the moral inversion of Christianity compared to what the, what the world prizes. Mm -hmm. This whole notion that Jesus said, blessed are the weak, blessed are, you know, are, are, are the poor, and blessed are the poor in spirit, the last shall be first. Uh, there's nothing in Jesus' teaching that I ever saw I, that's, that seemed to elevate worldly power. If anything, it, it was, you know, it was, it was the, uh, the opposite. Um, and so I, I just think that in the end, it, the criteria that we think 
is going to be applied to us in terms of, of the quality of our lives as, as followers of Jesus is probably going to be profoundly different, not just that the, than the world thinks, but a lot of Christians who are involved in, in, the, in the world um, thinks. Um, but again, I, I've, I'm not cynical about politics. I've, I've loved the chance to be in it. It's given me a platform I wouldn't have, and it's given me a huge amount of, of satisfaction. But, um, but it's, not the, it's, it's not at the top of my, the order of my loves. I always think of the Frodo and the ring, you know, and you know, the ring can, you know, have power over him as he's trying to destroy the ring, right? So I, right. I wonder if that's the line that ends up being walked so often in the halls of government. I've got the ring. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to possess the ring and I don't want the ring to possess me, right? So, right, right. Um, yeah, that's good. But, yeah. Well, thank you. Of very course. Much no, for, it's nice. Thanks, uh, everybody, for coming out. Uh, we are grateful for people like yourself who have been in the halls of government as well as in the media and uh, our opinion shapers. Uh, and I've just always been so grateful uh, for Pete's uh, witness in so many ways uh, to so much of our culture and our world uh, and, and as it comes from your deep heart of, uh, and your yearning to follow Jesus. And, um, I think we have a lot to learn um, from your witness and from your way of life, and, and I think you've given us a lot to think about as we've wondered about how we engage the world and how do we continue to um, be advocates for justice uh, for the sake of Jesus Christ. So uh, I'm going to conclude us with prayer, and then um, I'm going to see if there's somebody will be here to um, escort um, Pete over to the campus center and you're welcome to come on over and uh, greet him and uh, perhaps ask him a question that uh, I didn't get around to asking. So uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, this uh, chance for us to be together. Thank you for, uh, for Peter and for his um, thoughtfulness and his witness and his reflection upon the faith and upon the church's role in our society and how we may uh, be a, um, a unique witness uh, to the Savior and to uh, the Jesus way uh, to which we are all called. And uh, we thank you for the gift of the church and for opportunities such as this that we get to wonder how we can uh, be that salt and light in your world that the world may come to see through who we are, uh, the one who has so loved the world that he sent his only son. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We'll see you over in the campus center and